His reply amazed them. I think that translation might be, it shamed them. And we're going to talk about that later. This is the third Sunday in our worship series called A Season of Saints. It's a time that we have set aside before All Saints Sunday um, to think about who the saints are in our lives, those who have uh, helped us along the way, showed us the ideal uh, life in faith in some way. Uh, we've talked about some of the more uh, famous uh, Christians who in, in our tradition we would name as saints. Uh, we uh, talked about John Wesley and Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, and last week, uh, we also heard from you, some of the saints uh, who have been most influential in your lives. And so I hope that you're enjoying uh, this time uh, of thinking about and reflecting on who those people are in your life, who made you who you are, and that you're finding the connections with Scripture uh, intriguing and enlightening and, and kind of refreshing. Saints do inspire us as they are truly inspired by God. They're often prophetic, and they live not perfect lives, but certainly exemplary lives in certain ways as they witness to the truths of God's being, of God's character, and of God's intentions for us. A saint's witness might be seen through a continuum of behaviors, perhaps through consistent and small acts of love and compassion toward a people that we might otherwise overlook. Right on up to those bold kinds of witnesses, those life-threatening kinds of witnesses um, that we see from, say, Diedrich Bonhoeffer and our saint today, Ida B. Wells. In all cases, the witnesses of God show us both the transcendent sovereignty of a God who loves all people and an intimate presence and concern for the details of those lives. And no psalm portrays this character of God better than Psalm 99. Psalm 99 comes from a series of psalms that are called enthronement psalms. They're all right there. Most of them are between Psalm 90 and Psalm 100. And they all implore us to just give praise to God, just give all that praise to God because God is sovereign over all creation and over all people. So it reminds me of my alma mater uh, in Tennessee. We um, had a song, kind of a, a, a team song. It was called Rocky Top. And uh, m most people didn't really know all the verses to Rocky Top, but everybody knew the chorus, right? And so when we were doing well or when we needed to rally, everybody would just sing that to the top of their lungs. And scholars tell us that this is how these psalms would have been shared with uh, the, the Hebrew people as they worshiped. And I think you all did a pretty good job. You were pretty enthusiastic uh, as, as congregations go, as you responded um, to, to the call and response. But imagine a people who were so exuberant and they're, they're not sitting in pews, but they're just sitting around. It's almost like a, a, a praise party. That was the spirit behind which these psalms uh, were, were shared in worship. Now, Psalm 99 doesn't talk too much about creation. It goes right away to God is sovereign over people. Let the peoples tremble. And it's peoples, plural, intentionally in the Hebrew language. It's all people not just a group of people, Christians, Jews, Democrats, Republicans. It's all peoples. God has a passion for justice. And three times we declared God is holy. Do you remember doing that? You remember saying that? 
God is holy. And when you say that, or when you think about it, what is it that you think of? You think of a white-bearded guy up on a throne, looking down, shaking his head. In the Hebrew tradition, to be holy is truly to be set apart. But the God of the Hebrew people was not set apart from the world, as were the other gods, as were the kings who ruled the nations. Our God is set aside for the people, to the people. Our God is holy for us. And part of the, of the meaning of that holiness is that we also, made in the image of God, are holy. And we are called to be with God in being, in being set apart on behalf of all the peoples and especially the peoples who need to advocation. Moses and the other saints that the psalm uh, recalls, they were intercessors for their people, as was Ida B. Wells, as was Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And the psalm uses Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Yahweh is the reference to a God who is intimately present with us. Worship Yahweh. Tremble before Yahweh. Yahweh is the king who brings justice, transforming justice to communities, to peoples who live in community. God is a lover, a lover of justice. And so are we called to be as well. Jesus in the temple that week, when he tells the Pharisees, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, is a lover of justice. All week long, he's been sparring with the religious leaders in the temple. It was the week before his crucifixion. He had paraded through the city gates on a donkey. He had walked into the temple and turned over the tables of the money changers. And he was there healing people and teaching in the temple, and they wanted to know by what authority Jesus was doing these things. Because you see, the Pharisees, their allegiance had been divided because of the power of the Caesar. And so, render unto Caesar what is Caesar is not just a, a, a reminder that we have to pay taxes. It's the right thing to do. It was a reminder to them that in that very temple, they were practicing idolatry and blasphemy. And the, the irony was that the Jewish people had to pay taxes to Caesar in order to buy and sell and trade and even worship in peace. It was a tough spot to be in. But what Jesus was trying to say was, this is the reality. But for you, for you to withhold justice from others who would be here close to God and use Caesar as an entrapment, that goes against all that God intends for us. Ida B. Wells was someone whose life, I believe, exemplified this witness of Jesus 
and also of intercessory uh, work on behalf of those who are oppressed. She was born into slavery in Mississippi during the middle of the Civil War. After the emancipation, her parents were active in Freedmen's Aid Society of the Methodist Episcopal Church. And if you have studied church history, you know that during the Civil War, yes, even the Methodist Church divided over slavery. And the Methodist Episcopal Church was the African-American arm of the Methodist Church at the time. And that society, through the church, established Rust College. It is the oldest of the historically black colleges and universities in this country. Ida B. Wells had the witness of her parents as saints for her. As she went on, at first to go to Rust College, but then her parents died of yellow fever and she had to quit college and take a job so that she could feed the rest of her family. But it was an incident in 1884 that really set her on her journey toward social justice advocacy. You see, she was seated in a legally integrated lady, lady's car um, for which she had bought a ticket on a train bound for Memphis when she was asked to move to a smoking car to accommodate a white woman. When she refused, the conductor started to drag her from the car. She continued to uh, protest um, and didn't leave the car uh, willingly, let's just say. She was forcefully removed. And she later sued the railroad. And initially she won her case, but it was appealed at the Supreme Court and the Tennessee Supreme Court overturned it. But that made the headlines of the news, and it helped her launch her own career in journalism at age 25. In 1889, Wells became a partner in Free Speech and Headlight, which is, was a M Memphis newspaper with a really wide circulation among black and Christian audiences. And there, after two of her friends were lynched, she began to an investigation to exp uh, uh, expose the lynching, and a crusade against it. And she wrote a very important work, which we can read even now. It's called Southern Horrors, Lynch Law and All Its Phases. And when her work was suppressed in the United States, she managed to get it printed in Europe and thus continue the exposure and heightening the awareness of the injustice in the United States. Her newspaper, she, she eventually had her own newspaper, and it was burned down uh, as a threat to her. She later moved to Chicago, where she continued to work for uh, the women's suffrage movement for um, all races. Uh, she worked for children in Chicago. She was one of the two women founders, one of two who were women and founded the NAACP. Her style was not well received by some uh, African-American leaders at the time. You know, she was a uh, rather in-your-face kind of person, um, and she had to constantly deal with that. Uh, so her name is not officially on that registry, but she was a, a, a founder of the NAACP. Ida B. Wells knew from the witness of her family, from the witness of her people, even though they were oppressed, from the witness of scripture, she was a Christian and a faithful follower of Christ, active in her church. And she knew what it meant to be a lover of justice. So, we ask ourselves today, in what ways are we lovers of justice? In what ways do we move from this idea of mercy 
which is really important. In the church, we do, we do acts of mercy. But what do we do beyond that to help those who are oppressed to thrive as equal members of our society? We know that racism hasn't ended. We still fight uh, sexism. We, we fight um, injustice in, in politics. We fight injustice in sexism. There, we still have these issues. So where do we see injustice in our communities? And I know some of us will say, well, I've, had, I've done my time. I'm, I've, I'm older now. What can I do? Because those are maybe dangerous, uh, dangerous stances to take. But that is why I am so glad to be a United Methodist, because social justice is such an important part of how we understand our calling to faith as a church. And so here at Desert Skies, we work with other agencies, Interfaith Council, we work with Casa Maria, we, we work with um, different agencies, offering what we have in mercy, but also working alongside to do acts of justice, to bring justice in the world. And so I applaud you for that. I applaud us for that. But I also ask, where in your neighborhood, where in your own community do you see injustice? Because it's there. And what lenses do we need to put on or take off in order to see it and be in, in line with our God who calls us to be lovers of justice? Our God is a God who is set apart for the community, and so are we. Thanks be to God. Amen.